Hello, this is Sandra Osterberis bringing you a few words of Bible from the heart of Biblical Israel. This week's Torah portion is Balak, and it's named for the king of Moab who hires Balaam, that prophet, in order to curse Israel. Now, let's take a look at this story for a, set, for a second. The character of Balak is a very interesting character. On the one hand, he is clearly a prophet of God. God speaks to him. And in fact, he himself is very loyal to God. And he makes it very clear from the beginning that to Balak, who's hiring him, who's paying him good money, and he is hiring him for one purpose only, to curse the nation of Israel. But Balak says he will do that only if God enables him to do that. And he makes it very clear. He says, you know, uh, I can't go against God's word. I will only tell you what God tells me to tell you, etc. So, uh, um, uh, and you see that also, uh, there's a number of places he said it, but, but there's one place he says it in a very beautiful way. It's in chapter 23, verse 8. He says, how can I curse what God has not cursed? And there you have a sense that it's not only a question of, I will only repeat the actual word of God, the prophecy that God gives me, tonight or whatever, but it's it's something more, um, you know, you get a sense that maybe there's, there's some a deeper understanding here that if God does not curse the nation of Israel, how can I curse the nation of Israel? And you begin to wonder that, wait, does he, does he also identify with God's message? And this, of course, is where Balaam becomes a complicated figure. Because on the other, on the one hand, he is loyal to God and he believes in God and he is loyal to uh, transmitting God's word. On the other hand, and, 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 and what happens, of course, is instead of cursing the nation, he blesses the nation of Israel because that's what God wants him to be doing. But on the other hand, you have all along the sense that he really would like to curse. Well, the first thing is that he even takes... He takes the job to begin with, and I don't know if it's, I don't think it's just about the money. You get a sense he really wants to curse the nation, and uh, in fact, there's all these uh, attempts that are being made to, to offer sacrifices to God, in which even though he recognizes the God of Israel, and he believes in him, he is treating the God of Israel with a very pagan kind of way, where he's saying, well, maybe if we offer enough sacrifices, we can bribe God, and we can get him to give me a, a curse for Israel instead of a blessing. But where you really see uh, Balaam's true nature coming out is not in this week's portion, but later on in chapter 31. And here we have uh, the war with the Midianites, at which point the, um, it is the nation of Israel has the opportunity to uh, take revenge on what this, these people have done. What have they done? And this has to do with the, uh, with the situation of the story of Baal Peor. What happened in Baal Peor? You have these Moabites and Midianites who are basically seducing the men of Israel. Uh, and it is a kind of idol worship, the worship of Baal Peor, that has both idol worship with sexual uh, elements to it. So these women go out, they seduce the men. The men, therefore, cohabit with these women and at the same time take part in this pagan worship of Baal Peor. And it is a terrible sin and it it brings forward terrible punishment uh, upon the nation of Israel. And, uh, and and that story happens and it comes to an end. And there's no place in the story itself that there's any mention that there's a connection between the story and the whole story of Balaam that comes right before it. Uh, and you may, and, and, and what's interesting, by the way, about the story of Balaam is there's no place anywhere uh, in the Bible that we have a sense uh, that all this is written here, the children of Israel who are sitting in the valley below, who are being looked upon by Balaam and Balak, uh, wanting to curse them, there's no sense that the nation of Israel at the time have any awareness that this is all going on, that, that there's this attempt to curse them, that the nation of Israel doesn't know anything about it. They find out about it later, but they don't know anything about it now. So... But when we see one little verse in, in, the, uh, in the Bible tells us that there is actually a direct connection. And that's in chapter 31, verses 15 and 16. And here we find out that as part of their war, they are going to kill Balaam. 
And why are they going to kill Balaam? They're going to kill Balaam because he came up with the idea of Baal Peor. And put that little verse together with the whole story and you create a picture of Balaam that suddenly everything is clear. Balaam was eager to curse the nation of Israel. He doesn't like the nation of Israel. But as a prophet, and a real prophet, not a false prophet, he is obligated to stick with God's word. But unlike most prophets that God has selected, that you see they are truly righteous men. And so when he selects them and they bring the word of God, it's not just that they're bringing, they're, they're not just like a megaphone for God, but they themselves have a 100% identification with who God is, what his teaching is, what his messages are. Completely different with Balaam, because Balaam himself really wants to get the nation. How do we know this? Because when, his, the, when the plan for him to curse the nation fails, he then goes to Balak and he says, okay, we failed to curse them. What we need to do is get them to sin. Because if we get them the sin, God will punish them. He'll it will punish them. He'll do the work for us. It was a brilliant idea, and it was a brilliant idea just because he really does know how God works. That God blesses the nation of Israel, but He will punish them if they sin. And therefore, it was his idea to lure these men of Israel to the worship of Baal Peor by sending these women to seduce them. Okay. So then the next question is, okay. Why then does God speak through Balaam? Why would God choose Balaam to be a prophet when he's so not a righteous man, where he is an evil man, where he has only the worst intentions, except that he is loyal to God's word. He, he follows instructions. But as a person, he's a horrible person. He's not righteous at all. And I think this gives us an insight into something else. Yes, God chooses his prophets, and usually they're righteous men of Israel, and they are bringing forward a word. But sometimes God chooses people who are not righteous because he wants to use them. And look how this man is being used. Because he is loyal to God's word, there he is in front of the nation of Moab, in front of the Midianites. They come together there. Uh, he's, he's prophesying. He's saying wonderful things about Israel. He's praising Israel. Imagine if some of our international leaders today would be, even if they themselves want to destroy Israel or they want to harm Israel or they are against Israel in one thing or another, imagine what would happen if they, though, were loyal people to God in the sense that if God told them you have to make this pronouncement, they would make a pronouncement. Imagine what kind of influence that would be that even someone from the nations who is not a fan of the nation of Israel, when they make a pronouncement about Israel that is good in line with God's will, what an effective message that can come out to be. And I think that's something that tells us a lot about how God operates. He, Yes, he wants righteous people, but he sometimes will use less than righteous people if it serves his purpose. Have a wonderful weekend. Shabbat Shalom. I hope you enjoyed that film. And we have lots more film content and emails and articles that I'm sure you will enjoy as well. Check out our website at cfoic.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that right from the homepage. I know you will really enjoy the content that will land in your inbox on a regular basis. Hope to see you soon.